first of all, thank you for coming profoundly. And just to take a moment to acknowledge that the film can provoke some strong emotions. Um, I, we always say this and we always try to offer support. So we do have a therapist in the room if anybody feels they need to talk to um, someone. Could you raise your hand? Yes, great. <laughs> All the way in the back. Could you stand up? There you are, super. So if anybody feels the need to talk, um, just walk that way. <laughs> or afterwards, you can find her in the back. Also, on our website, thetailmovie.com, there's a lot of resources. And there's also a call-in number if you want to talk further. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. So um, thank you to the Museum of the Moving Image. And thanks to Tarana and Jennifer. Uh, for this discussion, and thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, so I thought we'd start off, uh, since we're at the Museum of the Moving Image, uh, to talk a little bit about the importance of uh, movies and storytelling in our culture. Um, are they important at this cultural moment? Why are they uh, important? And um, Tarana, for you, uh, why did the tale touch you when you saw it? Well, hello, everybody, first of all. Thank you for coming out on a Sunday. It is Sunday, right? It yeah, Sunday. it's OK. Yeah. It's, still fun. <laughs> it's hard to keep up sometimes. <laughs> yeah. um, so t in parts, one, we were just having a little bit of this conversation. Uh, narrative um, and storytelling is incredibly important. Uh, particularly for the work that we're doing. Uh, a movie like this resonated for me on many levels. It's one, because it is important to have stories to to sort of undergird the, the work, right? To have, I can give a bunch of speeches and I can go and talk to people and, you know, go on television and talk in depth about the, the you know, sexual violence and the effects of it and what it does. And it still won't amount to what a movie can, like the tale can do. Like in one setting, sitting, people can see themselves, they can find themselves in the, in the narrative. And, or people who, who it hasn't happened to can ha has a, have a different entry point, right? That they can negotiate on their own and like kind of listen to and, and let it work into their psyche. It's just, it just plays such a different role. Um, I think a lot about, I'm a law and order head. <laughs> We should have a name, like SVUEs or something. <laughs> but, uh, but I think a lot, it's the 20th year of that, of that show, yeah. and what they've done in 20 years to help the general understanding, even though clearly we need lots more work, but so many people have a different understanding about sexual violence, have language that they picked up from that. That's really important. It's been a very important contribution to the work. I think also, what I have kind of come to understand is that human beings don't understand what they don't go through. And I, including myself, because I've had this aha moment many times when something I thought, oh, I get it, and then it happens to me and I'm like, oh, I didn't get it at all before. Um, and what I have come to understand is what we do as filmmakers is we create an experience, and particularly fiction, this is my first fiction, as many of you may know, we create an experience that people can get into characters' heads, go on a journey, and in that journey, what happens is they emotionally invest and feel and look around as if these things were happening to them. And so the journey allows them to experience what they, what they might not have or experience in a different way. And my hope, I think, in creating the tale for those people who haven't had this experience, they can have this enjoyable fiction ride with music and beautiful actors and beautiful costumes and get in and then slowly understand from the inside the experience of the character of Laura Dern playing me <laughs> and of a child 
being attracted to adults that take advantage of her. So I think fiction is quite unique, and when it's done well, whether or not this is, is something else, but when it's done well, it takes you out of yourself mm -hmm. and gives you something new. You know what, uh, uh, what you were talking with occurred to me too is that there's a, there's a certain permission that happens when you experience a narrative and film like this, right? And so one of, the, oh, one of the things that happened for me in terms of why it resonated is that I remember thinking, I should be talking more about this, right? We, in, in uh, the, the ways, particularly how like Me Too went viral and it became this pop culture phenomenon, phenomenon in, way, in many ways, it forced me to keep talking about it, letting other people create the, the narrative and talk about it within their, the, the way they describe it. And I remember thinking after the movie, we're, we're wasting a lot of time not talking about grooming and not talking about child sexual abuse and not, you know, and so it allowed me, a, I, mean, I don't know if permission is the right word, but it feels sort of like an, a permission to go into a different place. And then I have something to back that up, right? And say, it's like, well, like, like in the movie The Tale, when they did such and such and such, you know, like it just gives you this extra space that that um, that feels like you didn't have before. It's like, oh, everybody's accepting it. Okay, well, let's really talk about that. Well, and and, and you're a renowned documentary filmmaker. So so, what was your thinking? Uh, because I suppose it could have been a documentary, and I don't know if that would have been as strong mm -hmm. as a, as a narrative film. So so, why did you feel like this story? needed to be a narrative film as opposed to a, a, a documentary? I think that um, for me, first of all, there are no images. And this is something we all talk about a lot with sexual abuse. Generally, it's two or maybe three people in a room, and there's a child and perpetrators and the perpetrators generally never talk, as we've witnessed recently. <laughs> so there, there was nobody who would ever talk about the event um, that I, I believed neither Bill or Mrs. G would speak. So that's one piece. But the other piece is the desire to explore creatively with the wealth of language in film, what is memory, which I didn't even know when I started. Like, how do you show memory? What was in my mind? Well, I thought I was older. Uh. I thought I was older. We all think we're older when we're 11, 12, or 13, yeah. or nine even. I, I have to say, you know this already, <laughs> but this, that is the most profound moment in the movie to me. That um, I remember, <laughs> having to like, well, the first time I watched it, I couldn't rewind, but when I got to the <laughs> place where I could, like, I have to watch that part again, and I tell people to pay attention at this part, because the the scene, one, it was something that happened to me um, in, a, in a similar way, but the scene when you, when you, when watching the movie with what you think you are, the age you think you are, and then switching to the age that she really was, and that moment going through the photo albums, it was in a very specific way for me because I, I was six years old when I was first sexually assaulted and carried the weight of that for many years as my own fault. And it was, I remember only remembering pieces of things that I knew very clearly. I knew the coat that I was wearing. I knew that I was wearing this blue coat. And I remember that I got that blue coat for Christmas. And I, and I went to my mother's house at the point when I was going through my sort of journey around healing. I went to my mom's house, very similar to in the movie. My mother is the photographer of the family, so we have tons of photo albums. And I kept going through photo albums until I could find the coat. This was me being a detective trying to piece the pieces together. Right? That's why Dr. Ford's like testimony was so resonated with so many people because you know we spend so much of our life trying to forget. And I remember going finally getting it was, I, I got that photo album and opened it and I found a picture of me smiling with the coat, just taking it out because it had fur around the collar and I just, you know, just loved it. And it was December of 1979, which is how I could discern that I was six. And also looking into my face, for real, and taking in my six-year-old self and not this fast or, you know, you know, out there girl that I had created in my memory, 
but this baby that part of the movie was so important for me and i think it's important for people to see that we there's also the part of the, that society puts on girls about our own complicity and our abuse and a lot of it has to do with fastness and doing too much at a certain age or being grown and all these kind of labels and not about the power dynamics and so um so that was particularly important and i don't you couldn't have done that in documentary and and i think what we try to do with art, so to speak, is we transcend the specific to the universal. And once in a while, we, we find something like that that, that that does it. In my case, like you, if I, I would not have remembered the year, the time, as you know from the film, I didn't know if it was fall or winter. I didn't know if the fireplace was on or off. But frankly, I wouldn't have known the year if it wasn't that I had diaries mm -hmm. and the tale itself. And so memory is so fragile. But for me, what is so interesting is what you do remember. Exactly. You remember, like, I never forgot my coach's voice. Mm -hmm. And when I met him in the present to write the tale, it was like, womp, because he has a very unusual voice. Mm -hmm. I never forgot the way he ran, like he had a very unusual gait. I never forgot whole um, units of dialogue that you heard in the tale. Like, I hate to be graphic, but the physical scenes with Jenny are straight verbatim from memory, and not the action. The action was actually probably a little more graphic than in the film, but the words are exactly what I remembered like that. Mm -hmm. But other things I did forget, like year and mm -hmm. place, and you need, we need, That's we need thing. evidence, sorry. Yeah. We need evidence. Yeah. Well, this, this is taking us right towards, <laughs> towards the Kavanaugh uh, situation. Mm -hmm. um, so we're gonna go there, and I'm really curious as to what your takeaway is from that. But it sounds like the, um, you know the 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 recent publicity and uh, the phenomenon of Me Too has been primarily focused around adult mm -hmm. abuse. So, but but it sounds like uh, there is no difference, and I mean, and and there is a place in Me Too, and, and always has been a place in Me Too uh, to talk about child sexual abuse. It that's. That's actually where it started. Mm -hmm. And and I think this is why, and, I, and I, I get it. I get it because the media shaped a lot of the narrative. So people are always like, we need to include this, we need to include that. And I'm saying it's all sexual violence, all of it. Because at the end of the day, the, the, the reason why Me Too resonates for so many people is that if I, you know, we have completely different situations. If I tell you that I'm a survivor of child sexual abuse and you say you were assaulted on a college campus at, you know, older, age, we can't connect about that, the, the, the details of that. But when I say to you that my memory is terrible, or I sleep with the lights on, or I do these quirky things and try to cope, that's where we connect, Yeah. right? That's where, yes. it's the, it's the we're unified by this trauma that the, that the, the things we went through, you know, leave on us, the, yeah. that mark. And so that's why it's, the circumstances may be different, but I can say me too to you. We, th I have a deep empathy for what you've been through because I, I understand it. Yeah. So it includes child sexual mm -hmm. abuse, it includes all of those things. And I happen to be a survivor of child mm -hmm. sexual abuse as well. Mm -hmm. And the young people who I dealt with when we first started with, a lot, they were kids already, so it was clearly, that's and what that it was. That was in 2006 when you started? That was, well, that's 2006 when we, this is always like a sort of fluid thing. I've been doing the work a long time. In 2006, we started a MySpace page that <laughs> said, yeah, me MySpace. too. Wow. Um, and uh, like maybe the year or two before that, we started using the, you know, the term. Mm -hmm. But yeah, for practical purposes, yes. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the issue which comes to exactly what Me Too is about is that women particularly, and we all know child sexual abuse is not just for girls, it's girls and boys. Across gender spectrum. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, but women and girls, if we just talk about on the gender 
all of us experience a range of violence across our lives. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when I show the tale, of course people want to say, how did that affect you and what about this trauma? And really what I want to talk about is the river of trauma mm -hmm. that I've lived in and that I've survived. And it's because, and I don't want to be hysterical about it, but being a girl into a woman, into an older woman, is dangerous. And most of us experience a range of violence that we have learned till Me Too, which I am so grateful to you for raising, have learned to swallow yeah. because not to swallow is not to survive. Yeah. And frankly, I am going to survive. I hear that. Yeah. So, <laughs> yes. Well, that, that I think is, is kind of spot on to something that you recently wrote about, um, which is, um, you know, so much of the media attention has been on the accused rather than the abused. Yeah. And so I, I thought it would be good, and again, we're going to get to Kavanaugh, but I thought, <laughs> but this is all Do about Kavanaugh. To, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I thought, it, could you talk a little bit more about the commonality of the people who have suffered abuse, how it crosses, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think I talk a lot about the spectrum of sexual violence. And, and I think it's important, one of the things that Kavanaugh did show us is the, the, the deep um, ignorance, if you will, that people have around the reality of sexual violence and the life cycle of a survivor. Um, and so there are people who have been you know, sexually harassed and, and have been, you know, and that ranges, right? Because we've also only been seeing sexual harassment framed in one way in the media. There's ranges of sexual harassment from not being able to walk down the street to you know, being working or worshiping or living in in um, communities or in spaces where people use you know, you know have gender based sort of violent actions towards you, whether they be verbal or, or nonverbal. Um, but then and then it goes from there. The spectrum just keeps going, and so then you have and when you leave sexual harassment to fester, it creates space for these other things for violence to happen. So you have you know, child sexual abuse, and then you have uh, intimate partner violence, and you have all of these things that happen along this spectrum. Um, wait, I forgot your question. No. Well, <laughs> what, I, what, I was a, what I was asking about, and I mean, you're, you're, you're answering it in part, but, but you made a really good point, is oh, that about so the, much of the media right, has right, been right. about. I'm sorry, that's my point, let me get back to that. So, the, but the, the reason why um, that's so problematic is that the people who said Me Too yeah. are across that whole spectrum. And largely, a, a good percentage of them, this is anecdotal, but I'm just going by my experience, are not even talking about harassment. In fact, because there's such a river of trauma that we deal with, and, so, and there's so much um, violence that's introduced in the lives of many women and girls, so many of us don't even think about the harassment. When I had a reporter ask me once about my experience with sexual harassment, I'm like, yeah, okay, all the time. You know, like the cat calls and the unwanted touches and all of that stuff. If you have been sexually assaulted, a lot of times you kind of have to, you, you, there's a way our mind, I guess, works to cope with that, that I can't even get into what that does to me because I'm still trying to deal with this. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the unfortunate thing that has happened over this last year is that we've had such a huge focus on the perpetrators, mm -hmm. on the people who are committing the crimes or the people who are being accused that we've paid no attention to the people who've actually said me too. And the reason why that's dangerous is because that's why we are in the place we are now. Mm -hmm. The narrative has been kidnapped, if you will, yes. mm -hmm. to the point where we, we started off at a witch, hunt, a witch hunt and now we're at a, you know, men and boys are in trouble. The yes. Me Too movement is trying to get you, right? It's been yeah. weaponized. And meanwhile, there's a story that just came out, a report that came out that said there've been 19 million Me Too tweets since last year. Wow. That's 19 million. There were 12 million engagements with the hashtag in the first 24 hours on Facebook. Wow. Each one of those hashtags is a human being, is a person. Mm. And they're not all telling me two story, but so many of them are laboring to give us their stories, yeah. to put them out in the world. And how dare we ignore that? So how do we, how do we ch how do we change that? Though? Well, I think for me, one of the effort with this film was to give voice 
to children and the child, Jenny, to speak. Yeah. Like, why did you do that? How did you get involved? What were you thinking? One of, if we come back from the range of sexual violence to <laughs> child sexual abuse, one of the problems we have is that we never give voice to the children that are being abused. We never hear them. We never hear what they're saying. And so for me, even in the writing of the script and the making of the film, I was really surprised what I discovered about her, the child that thought she was making choices. Mm -hmm. We have to listen. And I also think that in order to create change, we have to find a way as adults to elevate the voices of children yeah. in order to make them heard because they have no power. It isn't just to stop abuse, it's to hear it, to hear why, how, what, like, and the complexity of the way kids get involved. Mm -hmm. So anyway, to your point. No, yeah, I think it's, it's tragic right now what's happening because there would be, you know, even this last week, we've seen um, the, at the Harvey Weinstein uh, article, the anniversary of the article, people are like, oh, Me Too is a year old. And I'm like, here's the thing. If Me Too didn't go viral, and there was no, just this phenomenon, the, the Weinstein thing would have still been a thing, right? And it might have led to other big cases of other, you know, pro high profile people take, getting taken down, but it probably would have been, it would have tucked it out at some point. You know, because that, that, that's just how news cycles work. We'd be calling this like the Weinstein effect, right? Or the Ronan Farrow effect. <laughs> but what Me Too did was take everyday people who gave voice to this and said, this is what's happening in our lives. And that really was the, the foundation of what was happening. And so a year later for us to not, this is what fascinates me. I'm fascinated by the fact, just, and, and I really am fascinated, I'm disgusted by it too, but I'll say fascinated for now that you could, as a journalist, or as a sociologist, or people who, anything that's dealing with interacting with people or giving information, that you could look at the millions of people saying me too, and nobody thought, God, how did we get here? How did we get to a place where this many people's lives have been affected by this one thing? We would never let it stand if it was something else, if it was a disease, if it was, it, we, we'd be on top of it. It's a really and good and point. how do we how do we let that happen? Where are the like five part specials on sexual violence in America? How did we get here? How do a, you know nineteen million people ha like? Why do we not care? I know that we into salacious gossip. We like the headlines. We love the the big names coming down. It is it's, it's interesting to watch. And you're like, oh boy, another one. And and there's a sense of accountability that we haven't seen. I'm not trying to discount that. But my goodness. No, but we, we, we get into the whole thing of what's this corporation going to do? We, exactly. we get the personal of, of the, oh, uh, the abusers, and then we get the, the, the career uh, effect that it's going to have. And then we get the how are they going to come back. And how are they going to come <laughs> back. Can they come back? <laughs> well, and then it's Did all. Did you just get your answer there? Yeah. I guess. No, yeah, that's yeah. not. That's and not it's the about answer. power. That's it's not, about exactly. power. It's, it's what you brought up earlier. It's all about the vertical of power, and that we never stop to understand why is this such a phenomenon, mm -hmm. and and really investigate it because power doesn't want to know. Uh, and I'm gonna say it's that's not the answer. That there is there is. As a movement, as, as the work that I represent, I will say that. We absolutely believe in restorative justice. I don't believe in general that people should be discarded as human beings. Um, but there, I was about to talk about what we were just talking about backstage with this power dynamics. Yeah. There has to be something in place that people see. The reason why people had, women very largely, had a visceral reaction to Louis C.K. coming back and doing this stand-up was, we don't, what happened in this year? How do you get to just come back? You don't get to, where are those women, right? Take the, take the millions of people off the table for a minute. We really don't even know what happened in the lives of the women in the Weinstein article, or the women that, you know, that were accused of, who accused this and that. We don't know what happened, we don't know. I've talked to some of these people. When Weinstein was arrested, there was no massive celebration and breaking out the champagne. They were terrified about how their lives were gonna be further torn apart. We don't tell those stories. 
right? And that's that is just it's wrong. I don't I don't have another way to put it besides it's it's just wrong. You know, and so the coming back is not it's not that folks can't come back, but you want us to buy your tickets, you want us to watch your movies, you want us to go to your show, you want us to do you want the public to support you. Then you owe the public something. We need to see that if some if peak folks came back, even Kavanaugh, I know we keep trying to talk about him. But if accountability is not just so and so lost, let's move as lost his job, let's move as made seventy five million dollars a year. He ain't spent all that money. He'll be fine. Right? These people are not suffering. But like, how about come back and say, listen, I've spent the last 10 months doing some soul searching. The first thing I did was reach out to those women who I violated. And I asked them, what do you need to be made whole again? What can I do as a human being? I know I can't change what I did, but is there anything I can do to help you feel whole again? Number one. That would make a difference. How about that? Wow. And then you come back and you, and you say, I went and I talked to so-and-so and I read such and such and I did this, th- I, d- I worked, I put in some work because I don't want to just come back. I don't want you, I don't want the world to think that what I did, to not see the gravity of what I did. Mm-hmm. We want to hear, I love Louis C.K. As a, like as a comedian, he's one of my favorites. I want to hear your jokes. I want to hear the levity about what you went through this year and how it's, I want to hear that, but I don't want to hear that unattached to a body of work that you did to get back here. That's the problem. It's not that they can't come back. Yeah. I mean, it's such a simple thing that you're saying to say, go to the people who suffered the abuse and talk to them. I mean, not rocket science. Yeah. Um, but often there is none of that. There's only punishment and then a blank which is the sad part. Restorative justice I agree with, Mm -hmm. but there has to be a process of how we deal with perpetrators. And both have to be restored, not just the perpetrators. Exactly. Both have to be restored. Yes, exactly. Okay, so now, Dr. Ford. I mean, what is, uh, you know, in light of this conversation, um, I'm just curious as to what you both feel is the takeaway from that event in its totality? I mean, I think I was particularly watching because so much of Dr. Ford's testimony reminded me of my own memory and what I, what I do remember and I don't remember. Mm-hmm. And even the way she said things mm-hmm. reminded me of that. And the fact that Kavanaugh or Judge don't remember anything doesn't surprise me. Mm -hmm. I mean, if they did, of course they would deny it, but let's just take on face value they don't. Because what I know about memory, there's a whole lot I forget, but trauma I remember. Mm -hmm. And if something isn't traumatic, then why remember it? Even this whole question of other people not remembering the event, why would they? Like she it said, was, it was uninventful. For yeah, them. it was just in every day. They did it every day. They got together in the summer. So for me, it was particularly poignant and particularly obvious that the man, you know, the president in power of this nation himself doesn't believe in assault or that assault is real and was pushing it through so that there wasn't a proper investigation. So here we are. And I found it really tragic, and I find it tragic as a message to survivors to not come forward because this is what's going to happen to you. So for me, it was a really sad moment. And the question is, how can we use our voice now? I, (laughs) I was in the room, you know, I was in the hearing. And I was so, uh, I woke up that morning praying for her. I literally like opened my eyes and she, she came to my heart immediately. Because I can't imagine, most of us never get to walk into a courtroom or a hearing or anything where you get to tell your truth to people, whether it's to be judged or not. And I kept thinking, how nervous she must be, how scared she must be, how. And she came into the room, and she's a small-statured woman, you know, 
she looks like your professor or whoever, you know, nice lady at work. And that shaking in her voice when she first started talking, it just destroyed me. But she kept talking and she kept talking and she had some levity and she was a real person and bravery looks like so many different things. And it was just so brave because I kept thinking in my mind, every time she had to face the Republican side, like I would have just walked out. Just like, I'm not doing this with y'all. I know you don't care, I know you don't wanna hear it. Like, and she did it and she went through the steps. So, so there was that, um, and it resonated with me too. It was, it was not, listening to the account of what happened was hard, but the hardest part for me was listening to the account of what happened after. When she talked about hiding in the bathroom and waiting for them to go down the steps and hearing them laugh as they went down the steps, it just was too much. Um, so that's just the emotional side. On the political side, I guess, what I'm worried about most now, as much as I was, I'm sort of emboldened by, I'm, I'm disappointed in what happened, but the number of people that came out, the number of, you know, we called for that walkout that, that first Monday on Sunday, and, or like Saturday or something. It was just like, wear black, walk out, stand with Dr. Ka you know, Dr. Kavanaugh. We had a thousand people show up to the Senate atrium to march in the rain on a Monday from the Senate atrium to the Supreme Court. I know that we're disappointed in that, but there's something else happening. There's another thing happening where survivors are feeling an identity, a national identity, they're galvanized, and we don't feel, we feel vocal. And, and even in the face of something like Kavanaugh and the Senate Judiciary Committee and the President, we still speak. And there's something about her and her presence that says if she can speak, we can speak. If she can show up, we can show up. She was so vulnerable. She was she was vulnerable, and, but yeah. also strong. Yeah, and I think for me, I heard it. I was actually in Zurich with the film at the Zurich Film Festival, and I was listening to her as I was walking by the river. Mm. And I have to say, the rage I felt after listening to Kavanaugh, and I have never. I, this was a moment when I realized I didn't understand why people riot before that moment. <laughs> because I, but it, it sounds funny, no, but I, I was like ready to break things, yeah. to destroy, to hit, because I was so enraged by the way a person who doesn't even want to makes themselves so vulnerable and is spit upon. And, and what I felt was and that we have to hold our rage now and we have to use it and we can't say, oh no, it's bad to be enraged. Hmm. We have to hold it and we can't let it go and we have to use it as a motor to keep this this word and this voice alive that she shouldn't have spoken for nothing. And she didn't, right? She didn't, she, she did not speak for nothing. Her labor is done. She spoke, she has, she, now she has to us. never yeah. say another word again. Mm -hmm. I hope that she retreats and find a place to find peace in her life. She's done the labor. Mm -hmm. It's the, those of us who have taken this on. Mm -hmm. One of the things I, I, I really want us to have a healing action in this country. I'm still trying to figure out how to do it because the message that came from me from this, two things I want to say before we move on. Two, one is that this is not our burden. I'm really, I'm stuck in that place. Mm -hmm. We carry the burden of shame. We carry the mm -hmm. burden of fear. We carry the burden of doubt. I heard uh, Kelly, Ke wasn't it Kellyanne Conway? Mm -hmm. I heard her say on a, uh, when, she, uh, when she said on CNN or one of the shows that she was sexually assaulted and it was a moment of Everybody was shocked, and then she immediately pivoted and said, but I don't blame my senator, and I don't blame the politician, I blame the perpetrator. But these are people who we've elected and put trust in to make our communities less vulnerable to sexual violence. Mm -hmm. So this is their burden. Mm -hmm. It's not our burden to bear. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing about all the people that said me too. We have labored, that is such, people don't realize the labor it takes to even just say the two words. 
I think about visually, I think about people who sat in front of their computer watching me to go viral and thinking, should I say my stuff? Should I tell my story? Mm -hmm. Should I, what if I, what if I put the hashtag out and nobody likes it? Mm -hmm. What if I do this and -and so-and-so finds out all of the emotions, all of the energy, that's all labor that we put out and that can't be for nothing. Like, and it's not for nothing. Her testimony's not for nothing. Our labor's not for nothing. But our labor's not to be traded on. If we're going to labor, then we're going to labor for ourselves. Mm -hmm. We're not going to labor to be used in some kind of political game back and forth. Because I blame both sides. This is not partisan at all. Mm -hmm. Democrats is fucking up just as much as Republicans. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, seriously, this is not everybody, because it's not the seriousness. They're not understanding the gravity of this. It's not for political fodder. Right? I forgot my second point, but that was my first one, and I'm a <laughs> second point is I'll come back. But let's let's move on. I'm that was, sorry. That was that was a lot right there. <laughs> uh, you know the tale. Uh, I, I mean, you know, there's that stunned silence at the end of the movie. We've seen this movie with audiences before, but uh, if if you've uh, you know got your composure back, we'd love to hear some questions um, from the audience. So, uh, questions. Yay. That gentleman right there. One of the things I wanted to explore with the tale, although I wasn't literally sexually assaulted by Mrs. G, um, she colluded with Bill to bring me to him. And of course, as you know from the film, they were planning a foursome, um, which was hard even to believe in my own memory until I re-met Iris, who had submerged the memory. But it's really, really important to talk about how women um, both are, can be predators, but also often collude in, in it by silence, by turning the other way, closing their eyes. And that's why the story of Mrs. G, my mother, and my grandmother were really important to present. And sometimes it's as simple as keeping the status quo, like my mother with my father. Uh, And sometimes it's a character like Mrs. G. I never, I always wondered what would have happened if if that foursome happened. Hmm. Nobody saved me. Yeah, and um and this is what we see in people who have socialization that I Yeah. I just want to be clear that that line is fantasy on my part. I don't know if Mrs. G was sexually abused. A lot of her history suggests it, and maybe it's because I really did love her, which is something that I wanted to really explore with the tale how a child could love their abusers. Mm -hmm. But I really loved her and still love her, and so I look for reasons to get the blame off of her, frankly. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, yeah. Sort of 
integrates with issues which often seem like cultural relativism or the far away problem in you know, Africa or Asia. It's not really seen as an American issue. It's framed as a religious tradition. It's not sexual assault. It's not child sexual assault. Mm -hmm. And at its core, that's basically what it is. Mm -hmm. It's how to sort of integrate, as you're talking about this sort of umbrella of the Hutu movement, integrating some of these other issues uh, into this larger, larger picture. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Literally, our spectrum, so my organization, Girls for Gender Equity, also, we have a curriculum where we teach about sexual violence, and it is on our spectrum of sexual violence. Um, and I think it's just that we have to just, practitioners, people who are doing this work more so than um, the general public, have to incorporate it and understand, like, this education has to happen amongst our groups so that we can push it out as what it is. Um, for sure, femicide is also on our on our spectrum, right? And people just don't, they think about that as things that happen way off. But I also think this is where narrative and storytell storytelling comes in because, you know, I, I remember the first time I heard of genital, female genital mutilation is in Possessing the Secret of Joy. Um, Alice Walker's, no, was it? Yeah, Possessing the Secret of Joy, I think it was, is um, the Alice Walker book. And it, I was stunned by it, right? And that was in the early 90s. But it stayed with me and so I recognize it as a political issue and I could talk about it. So having these issues weaved into stories and into movies and into things like that, I think are really helpful. Mm. I also want to connect it to the gentleman's point because when I first learned about FGM, I felt like, What's FGM? excuse me? FGM. FGM, yeah. When I first learned about it, I felt like, ugh, I viscerally felt like I understood it. And one of the things that really struck me was that it's the grandmothers and the mothers who are holding down the child. And just it's the self-hatred of real free female sexuality that is constantly being abused. And um, I do think it's in the river of what we experience. So for me, just emotionally, it feels like part of my river. I don't, and yeah. You know, sorry to, uh, so for me, the urgency is that it's being framed, uh, so the case in Detroit is turning up in January, the first federal case against mm -hmm. FGM. Oh, wow. And Alan Dershowitz is jumping as a consultant to the defense, uh, framing it as a religious freedom issue. And so in Australia, we, there was a case wow. where it was overturned on religious freedom. So there are, there are it, it, it's sort of, it's, at this point, it's about sort of accountability and justice. If it isn't as child sexual assault, incest, child abuse, it's clear cut. We know it's not. It's right. Legal. My God. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, Way back there. There's two questions back there. Why don't you go go for it? <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Well, I hope you will take it out and do something in the world. The real Bill is way beyond the Statue of Limitations. He's quite hidden in the way I wrote the narrative. This isn't, running isn't his sport. So he's actually not somebody most people can find. Um, what I do want to say is one of the things that happened to me is that a loss of feeling 
for many years, and I really fought to kind of regain my feeling. <coughs> Again, as you know from the story, I didn't think of what happened as a negative, even though I saw the impact of it. So it's kind of weird. Yeah, there's one more in the back. Yeah, go ahead. So I'm curious, uh, with all the technology, like you're forgetting drum train wonders, what kind of Well, I mean, I think now it's actually more so. These kids document every part of their lives. And though, though some of it is performative, you can see lots of stuff. So, I mean, when I first started this, it was pre it predates like social media in the way that we know it now. It was more like chat rooms and MySpace and things like that. But also, young people, be because it's so normalized, what would happen was a lot of the young people would come to me and just tell me, because of the relationship I had, they would just tell me stuff. And it wasn't like, oh, Miss T, I want to disclose this th terrible thing that happened. It'd be like, oh, yeah, today I gave my um, dean a lap dance to get out of detention. And I'd be like, that's a true story. And, um, and I'd be like, wait, you know. So one, I think it's helpful to have relationships with young people. Young people are people, <laughs> right? And they talk and they understand things and they and what they don't understand if you have a close enough relationship with them you can help navigate them through um and that's that was my experience it's still my experience with the girls come through gge you know through our programs in gge um and we have that but also i keep a social media check on a lot of kids that are in my life and I can watch, you can see when things start turning, even my child, my, I have a 20 year old, you can see when the tides start turning, the pictures start changing, or the messages start changing, or the things they write, or the memes start changing. There are things that you can pick up. We have to sort of shift from what we knew. Like it's not the sad girl in the corner, it's just not participating, it may be overperforming. Um, I think we have to adjust more so than, um, than young people have to do what we used to do, we have to kind of adjust to what they do now and look for the signs in a different way. But they're, they're still there. What is a way of how do we get men to stop letting themselves off the hook when they rape little girls? Mm. Is my question. <laughs> That's a huge question. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that, I mean, my feeling is that the real bill was delusional and that child sexual abuse is occurs through. I don't want to get him off, this is not getting him off the hook, but it's like a mental illness. He thought he was doing something good because he was saving me from other boys who would have done it worse. And in a weird way, he saw me as an equal, even though I was a child. So there were all these delusions going on and fantasies about positive things he was doing for me and I we they're in the film to kind of lay bare a character that we don't often meet which is um 
I was hoping with the film th and through my story to to break down the black and white telling of what an abuser looks like. And so it was really important to me when we cast Jason Ritter that he's a lovely man. Mm -hmm. And he's the man who would never do this. Mm -hmm. And so because, as someone else, you said the mother was molesting her child, it's usually in the circle of trust. So it's family, it's a coach, it's a teacher, it's someone the child knows. But anyway, coming back to the person who abuses, unfortunately, how I see it is that they're really ill. And they've, they're in a, a situation that they're ill and they're in a situation of unchecked power. And the two things together give them ability to hurt a child in the way that they don't know that they're hurting, but obviously they are. And so for me, with restorative justice, um, and this is a totally untested remark, but for me, yes, we need to, um, we need to actually punish perpetrators, but we also have to treat it as an illness and a mental illness, so we have to really look at how do we heal and change the psychology. That is a thought I really feel personally, mm. and I feel like the real Bill is really ill. And when I met him in the present, he's a very famous athlete. He's a very powerful athlete. Um, who has been famous his whole career. He's a very famous coach. And basically, nobody ever stood up to him and said no. So whatever happened to him, which I think did, ran rampant in his behavior with girls. And maybe boys. We don't know. So, I think, to, yeah, please. I think there's, that's, there's different sides to it. I think that there's so much nuance, particularly around child sexual abuse, um, that we don't unpack, right? So the, your, you. right, your situation is a 40-year-old man and a 12-year-old girl. I didn't realize that until I was an adult that the person who assaulted me at six was actually 17. Mm -hmm. And so um, I remember, and I found this through Facebook of like this whole whatever, and seeing the age, I remember seeing the birthday thinking, my goodness, he was a child, mm -hmm. right? And a lot of child sexual abuse happens between children, between legally what we would call children, um, but there's still a power dynamic. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that I would call him sick mm -hmm. in my case. Yeah. I, I think that, um, I think the unchecked power is and privilege. For instance, in the Kavanaugh case, I'll say this. One thing that kept, that resonated for me is I can draw a straight line from the 17 year old white, male, privileged a boy who was probably not told no a lot, right? To the grown man who thinks he can make, the white, male, privileged, grown man who thinks he can make decisions about my body, right? Because you didn't, you, you didn't know to respect a woman's body at 17 and nobody stopped you. And that developed into this person and so, and so accountability looks really different in different situations. You're right. I think, You're right? absolutely right. There's, a, there's just a lot of nuance to it. And I mean, I know this is not an answer to your question in particular, but I think your question is it's more complicated than that. Then the, the, the man who tells, um, I, I have these memories of things that were said to me right after. So I was abused. I was assaulted at six. And then between nine and 12 again by a, another family friend molested over time, and then assaulted as an adult. The, the person, when I was assaulted as an adult, I was 20-something, I just had my daughter, and the thing I remember so much is walk after it was done, I was in Brooklyn, I'm from the Bronx, and don't know, I'm just saying to say I don't know Brooklyn, right? I didn't know where I was, and I had just fought this man to, 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 uh, to the point of exhaustion to keep myself from being assaulted, and then I just couldn't anymore. And when it was all said and done, I still had to go home. And I didn't know how to get home. And he walked me to the train station. Talking to me as if we were just coming from a date, and he's like, you know, when you get to the train, daughter, like, 
it just was, it was, I was so like undone, but my brain to survive in that moment just said to act normal, to keep talking. And so he was telling himself this was normal. Just like these men who say stuff like that, it's like to normalize it and to create yep. a imagery around it that makes it normal. And it's, you know, it's about us undoing the imagery. I don't know that we can do that to the man, but it's about us talking and speaking out loud about the the false imagery that they create around it and saying that's not real. Mm-hmm. I think that's more. And that's more entitlement yeah. also. Oh, isn't absolutely. It? I mean, the thing I'm so happy. Sometimes I get lost. Um, is to remember that assault and abuse is very different for each person. Even, for example, you use the word rape, and I never use the word rape. And I don't think that's denial for me. It's actually because sexual abuse for me was about someone manipulating me into saying yes. It wasn't violent. So for me, when you use the word rape, in my case, it feels like it diminishes what sexual abuse is to me, which is manipulation, an adult twisting to get a child to say yes. But however, I think that's part of the problem. Yeah, Sorry. however, <laughs> there are many people that call, feel sexual abuse is rape. So what we have to get used to doing is saying, what was it for you and how would you describe it? rather than putting words, I feel my abuser was mentally ill, but someone else may not. So there's, we have to look at the individuality, mm-hmm. even though all of it is assault, abuse, or rape, it, it's not one thing. Yeah, that's, I'm just, language is important. That's the only point I was trying to make. I think- It's really so important. Personally, you, you, know, you can identify in certain ways legally we know that it's rape because a child can't consent. Like when you, when the absence of consent is there. So, so I, you know, it's, I, I went through years when I couldn't hear the word rape. Like literally, when people said it out loud, I felt offended by it, and I would, I would it would trigger me. Now we know what that word is. But I'm like that with the word victim. I'm yeah. like, I'm not a victim. I mean, I yeah. really still feel triggered by that word. Yeah. Go ahead. It's and then I mean, this is what I'm saying. This people just. The, 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 the part about it that's hard is that as survivors, we're always still negotiating our own survivorship and understanding and it's evolving and changing and ebbing and flowing and, and the world, trying to get the world to understand what it is to be a survivor. But it's hard because it's not a universal thing. Exactly. The, the trauma is universal. Mm-hmm. The fact that you come away, but then again, like you, you went through, the thing I think is fascinating about your story is that you went many years until, until an adult not recognizing this in tra- as trauma or holding it in your body mm-hmm. as trauma from my understanding. Um, and then coming to it and having this recognition. Yeah, particularly because what I realized the first time I used the word sexual abuse was that to be a victim would have killed me quicker mm-hmm. than the abuse. Yeah. I really think if the adult world had said, no, you were sexually abused and we're going to prosecute Bill at 13, I would have been institutionalized. Wow. And I, it's very hard to figure out what exactly that is, but to be a victim would have robbed, a victim and seen as a victim would have robbed me of the very thing holding myself together, which was the false belief in agency. Mm. And so, for me, even <laughs> lies, even if it's a lie, if it makes you survive, it's better to lie to yourself. No, and that sounds that's really real. weird. That's but very real. Yeah. yeah. Do you have a question? I do, yeah. Um, just thank you so much for this. Yeah, this yeah. comes up. I'll, I, I'll, I'll, and then yeah, we, we can have. both <laughs> talk because that is the problem. <laughs> so the the question is really if you don't, um, acknowledge the abuse publicly, you don't stop the abuser from abusing others. And of course, that's my big regret. So basically, unconsciously, basically what I did was save myself because Bill and Mrs. G went into this black hole. I really, as far as I was concerned, I wouldn't have used the word dead, but they were as if they were dead and frozen. 
And I went on. And I was empowered, as you heard from Jenny, I'm the hero. I took what I took. They loved me. I was appreciated. But meanwhile, what happened to Bill? And what did he do? So this is the big and I don't have an answer. I also know that, and I hope that the film can be used to talk about what is, how can you help children face the truth without destroying them? I think that adults often come in with their big actions and also with their pity, mm -hmm. because pity is a horrible thing. Mm -hmm. You poor child, I feel so bad for you rather than to talk to the child about what is their story and allow the child to guide you how you what language you should use back to them so i'm hoping in 2018 that we are i think there have been movement to try to work with children better and that this film can help people think about children have their own narratives that have to be respected and when you work with kids, let's look at that and be very careful how we help them name what's happened and how we help them prosecute. So, <laughs> my answer is different. Mm -hmm. And this is, um, I don't think it's controversial necessarily, it's just different for, for different people. I completely understand that the perspective of we need to, you know, folks need to come forward so that the person doesn't continue. Um, not that that's a guarantee that that's what's gonna happen, mm -hmm. right? Um, in any shape, form, or fashion. But I just believe in protecting yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, we talk about all of the saying self-preservation is key and that kind of thing. I think that the trauma of sexual violence is so great mm -hmm. that adding the burden of you have to save the next person is not fair. Mm. It's, it's, if you have the wherewithal, if you can do it, then absolutely, we, we, I would encourage it. But I think particularly in this moment around like Me Too being public and viral, there's been this real big push. Every school I go to, there's kids, there's young people who say, you know, I really wanna tell my story, but I'm not ready, and you know, what should I do? Or um, I have a roommate, who this thing happened to, and I really want her to come forward, but what can I do to make her? And I'm always like, nothing. No, I you agree with you. Yeah, I agree like, with you. You don't, we don't owe anybody our stories. Not even the next victim. Mm -hmm. I just, we don't owe anybody our stories. What it takes to become whole again, to even try to become mm -hmm. whole again, is such a heavy lift on mm -hmm. your life. To place the burden of also, that is, again, not your burden to bear. It sounds selfish sometimes, and I'm trying to figure out how to say it in a way that doesn't seem like I don't care, because it's not that I don't care, and I want to stop perpetrators without question. But I, I want to figure out definitely how to help children have their own narrative, but I want to figure out how we do that without putting the onus on the survivor again and again and again. No, it's a great point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are we out of time? Okay, uh, I think that's, <laughs> that's, that's it. I'll just ask one last question, which is, um, you know, what, what is the best revenge and why should we be hopeful? That's <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a, no, it's a very hopeful moment. Sorry if we sound so negative, but I feel hopeful. And one of the reasons I feel hopeful is just two years ago or a year ago, this film would have died in Nobody would have looked at it, but because of all your work, because of what happened in the media around sexual assault, yeah. suddenly a taboo subject like child sexual abuse, which has been going on for centuries, right. let's be real, is coming to the forefront, mm -hmm. and we can sit in a room and talk about it openly. That is amazing. And we can have this dialogue about how we take care of people, how we continue, how we prevent, how we help people heal. So mm -hmm. I feel very hopeful. I feel hopeful as well. <laughs> I do. I feel like that, the, you know, people don't understand the life of a movement. 
And there are there are challenges and triumphs and movements and there are wins and losses and and so this this didn't start with me too going viral. It didn't start with me when I started me too, right? This has been a long fight. And I'm not necessarily invested in seeing the end myself. I'm invested in laying the groundwork because I'm clear that we'll win. I'm clear. I'm invested in knowing that we will win and working towards that end. And so whoever Amen. picks up the mantle after me will have I will have been left better, right? I'm here because Rosa Parks did what she did. I'm here because of Loretta Ross. I'm here because of all of these wonderful women whose shoulders I stand on, who prime the ground for me to do this work. And so I'm hopeful when women show up and men show up and people who identify however they want to show up and stand up and say, I won't be silenced. And not just I won't be silenced, but I'm in this fight. Mm -hmm. and, and the last thing I'll say is the, the best revenge is joy. Mm -hmm. The best revenge is finding, curating, and holding on to your joy in the face of trauma. Thank you to Tarana Burke and Jennifer Fox, and thank you all for coming tonight.